to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The wise Solomon said, Wine is a mocker, and strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1. Welcome to our study of the Truth Series. In this lesson specifically, we're dealing with God's truth on the subject of alcohol. How many of us know someone who in our probably immediate family may have had an alcohol problem? How many of us may know friends or family whose marriages have been broken up because of alcohol or whose lives are in shambles because somebody had an alcohol-related problem? Friend, this is indeed a subject that we need to let God's truth come forth about in our lives and in our words. As always, the Gospel of Christ program is brought to you by loving members of the Church of Christ who would love nothing more than for you to stop by in your local area and visit the Lord's Church. These are people who simply want to follow the Bible and be the church that you read about in the book of Acts. Maybe you'd like to have a Bible study. Maybe you've got Bible questions. Friend, here at our website, thegospelofchrist.com, we'd love to help you with those as well. If you've got a question or you'd like to study the Bible further, please don't hesitate to email us or write to us. Also, we want you to know that all our material, our lessons today and a host of other lessons are available from the website, thegospelofchrist.com, free for download, and if you'd like to have those in DVD or CD form, we'd love to send those to you as well to help each of us in our study of God's divine Word. As we think today about such a relevant topic as alcohol, friend, let's realize this is an important subject mainly because it is a biblical subject. Whatever God says on the subject, we need to listen and be prepared to accept. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21, the scripture says we've got to prove all things, hold fast, that which is good. When we think about and study what God says about alcohol and we go to the scripture as our source, our lives need to be changed because of that. We need to think about this important topic because it is a moral and ethical topic. Morally, we mean it causes one to be right or wrong. Ethically meaning it may cause us to make choices when one's under the influence that we naturally might not do without alcohol. And so this being a moral right or wrong subject, we desperately need to see what God has to say on this. And then of course, we want to study this biblical subject because there is a lot of confusion over the topic of alcohol. Even among Christians, there's a lot of confusion and yet God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37 through 40, he's spoken clearly on this subject. But friend, as we think about alcohol, we need to realize this is a topic that we desperately need to hear about and listen to because it's a relevant topic due to the danger of alcohol. Think about these numbers for just a moment. Did you know that three out of every 10 homes are affected in some way by alcohol? Did you know that marriages break up, multitudes of marriages break up every year because of alcohol? Domestic violence cases are either induced many times by alcohol or drugs. It affects the home greatly. Think about this number. There are estimated to be over 100 million Americans who have an alcohol-related problem. A hundred million with an alcohol-related problem. A survey done by the Gallup Poll said that 64% of our population says they have drunk or still do drink 
alcohol. And so, yes, this is a very, very serious problem. But today we mainly want to ask, what does God say for the child of God concerning alcohol? Friend, the scriptures abundantly teach that a Christian should not drink, should not use alcohol, and ought to abstain from those things. Let me give you some biblical reasons as to why such is the case in God's Word. First, the scripture teaches that alcohol has the ability to distort one's perception of what's right and wrong, what's real, and what's not real. Let me give you an illustration. Isaiah chapter 28. The scripture says this in verse number 7 concerning alcohol. They also that have erred through wine and through intoxicating drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. Notice, they err in vision. They stumble in judgment. They err in They don't know what is really what they're saying. Their judgments are not as clear as they ought to be. Uh, I'll give you another illustration. Look in Proverbs chapter 23, or notice Proverbs chapter 23, verse number 33. The Bible says of one under the influence, your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. Why is alcohol something I ought to stay away from? It causes me to err in vision, stumble in judgment, and I may see or perceive things that really aren't that way. Friend, if I am to be sober, Mark 13, verses 35 through 38, I'm to be watchful, I'm to be ready. And alcohol only deters my ability to do that? Surely a Christian ought to abstain from anything that's going to do that. Secondly, a Christian ought to abstain from alcohol because it has the ability to weaken one's moral alertness or awareness. Let me give you two or three illustrations. Genesis chapter 9. Noah has come off of the ark. He builds a vineyard. From that vineyard he makes wine and he drinks of that. And as a result, the Bible says he becomes drunk. And do you remember what happened to Noah? Noah... His sons, the Bible says, someone uncovered his nakedness and there was a curse placed upon Canaan and his family because of that. Would Noah have allowed that to happen? Would it have happened had he not been drunk and unable to respond? No, it wouldn't have. I'll give you another illustration. Genesis chapter 19, around verse number 32. You've got Lot and his two daughters, and the daughters are wanting to have husbands and children, and so they don't have any men of that area to have relations with, and so they, they concoct this plan. And here's their plan. They say, let's get our father drunk, and in essence, let's have relations with him. He would not have done that had he not been drunk. And so they got him drunk, and they went through with that plan. Why did they have to get him drunk to do that? They knew full well that sin and ungodliness would not have been tolerated by Lot had he not been under the influence. And so as we think about alcohol, it has the ability to affect one's moral awareness and to keep us from really being the kind of people God wants us to be. Let me give you another example. Look in Isaiah chapter 5, or notice Isaiah chapter 5. I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verses 11 and 12. The Bible says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, till wine inflames them, the harp and the string, the tambourine and the flute, and wine are in their feasts. But watch this. But they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of His hand. These people are not, they're under the influence. They're not thinking about God and His things. Why else should a Christian abstain from alcohol? We alluded to this a little bit. But alcohol, it impairs my ability 
to make good decisions. Now, do you remember two priests by the name of Nadab and Abihu? We're familiar with that story, most likely. Two men who offered a strange fire to God, and as a result of that ungodly sacrifice and their strange fire, God consumed them with fire. What led them to make that bad decision? Notice Leviticus 10, verses 9 through 11. The Bible says, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Now watch this. That you may distinguish between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord spoke to them by the hand of Moses. What's God here doing? He's saying, Nathan and Abihu, they made a bad decision, likely affected affected by some of these things, here's my law, God says. Don't drink wine. I want you to be able to distinguish between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean, and notice especially what verse number 10 says, that you may teach the children, verse 11, teach the children of Israel all the statutes. Alcohol affected their ability to make good decisions, and God said, I don't want y'all using that anymore. Now, this is not something that we don't understand today. We understand it also. On the, if you're operating big machinery, something like a backhoe or a crane or something of that nature, or some big machine, on the side of that it will have a sign that says, do not use alcohol when operating this. It impairs one's decision-making ability. Friend, we recognize that even in the world. If as a Christian I'm going to be held accountable for my decisions, for my actions, and for my choices, why would I want to put anything in my body that I may not be able to distinguish good and evil, holy and unholy, right and wrong? And so as a Christian, I need to be sure that I stay away from things like unto that. We also mentioned that alcohol is something that a Christian ought to abstain from because it can and does cause physical sickness whether it be cirrhosis of the liver, whether it be some type of heart problem or stomach problem, the use of alcohol is known to cause physical problems. I want to mention a case in the Bible where we see that from, again, from Proverbs 23. Here's a man who, under the influence, had problems with alcohol. Look at Proverbs 23, beginning in verse number 20. Do not mix with wine bibbers or with gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. Now, I want you to jump down just a little bit to Proverbs 23 and notice verse number 29, probably the most graphic illustration of the drunkard in the Bible. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Watch this. Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. Why should a Christian stay away from alcohol? Because it's hurtful and harmful to my body. We know this. Medical science has proven it. It's not something that a Christian ought to partake in, and so it is something that can and does hurt the body of a child of God. Friend, as we think about alcohol, there are some other reasons that a Christian surely ought to stay away from a substance like unto this. Mention some of those to you for just a moment, and just briefly, alcohol has the ability to take away one's intelligence. It's not something that will help me to be sharper. It's not something that will help me to draw closer to God. It's actually something that will help me to be less ready to take on the world and all the challenges that are out there. Notice Hosea chapter 4, verse number 11. The Bible says, Harlotry, wine, and new wine enslave the heart. They make me their master. They take away my ability to make good decisions and use my intellect for the things that God wants me to use them for. We also briefly mentioned that alcohol in the Bible is defined as the great destroyer 
of mankind. It has done nothing but bring problems to mankind and all those who use it have had a host of problems that go along with that. I mentioned to you Habakkuk chapter 2 verse number 5. Indeed, because he transgresses or sins by wine, he is a proud man. He does not stay at home because he enlarges his desire as hell and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all people. Notice now, sin is what separates us from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. And here the Bible says, because he transgresses by wine. Bringing wine and alcohol into my body greatly risk, increases my risk, lowers my moral awareness, and has the ability to cause me to sin when I'm under its influence. Friend, if I realize the damning effects of sin and that alcohol can contribute to that, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with that. We also briefly mentioned that in the Bible, men are actually condemned for giving other men alcohol to drink. Not only is it wrong for me to drink it, it's wrong for me to give it to others and contribute to their drunkenness. Notice Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 15. The scripture says, Woe to him, listen now, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his wickedness. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor. Not only is it wrong to drink it, it's wrong to contribute to and give it to others so that they can become drunk and their, lower, their moral awareness, just as in this context, might be turned the wrong way. Let's also realize that drunkenness is something we must avoid because it might cause one to be unprepared for the Lord's return. Luke 12, verse 45, and Luke 21, verse 34, there's the idea and image of the Lord coming, and some weren't ready, some were drunk, some weren't sober and alert. They were rather drunk when He came. They weren't ready for it. Friend, what if the Lord came while you were under influence? If Jesus came, would you want Him to see you holding a beer? The Lord returned, and you were drunk or tipsy. Is that something you would want to be happening at the Lord's coming? Would you really be ready and watchful at His coming if one is drunk? Also, the Bible clearly teaches Christians not to walk in drunkenness. Romans 13, verse 13, Do not walk in drunkenness, do not be of the night. The writer will say, For those things are of evil, not of God. What about a drunken lifestyle? Not for a Christian. Not somebody who's trying to follow Christ. The drunken lifestyle, the drunkard, that's not what's pleasing to Almighty God. And so, does the Bible teach that a Christian ought to be sober? Friend, it clearly does. And we want to mention three passages from Scripture that clearly illustrate I ought to be, a Christian ought to be sober. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 is the first passage. In a context talking about spiritual sobriety so that I could fight the devil, the scripture says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now that Greek word for sober literally means complete and total abstinence from any kind of inebriant, anything that would make me drunk. I understand in that context that the writer is talking about spiritually speaking, but if wine and alcohol has the ability to affect my decision making and my moral choices, can I be spiritually sober and physically a little tipsy? Friend, the two just don't go hand in hand. And so be sober spiritually requires me to be sober physically as well because the two are naturally entwined together. Be sober. That's God's command. Then, Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18. Someone says, where's the passage in the Bible that says, do not be drunk? It's right here. Explicitly, God says, do not be drunken with wine, wherein is dissipation, rather be filled with the Spirit. 
Where does the Bible say it's wrong to be drunk? Right here. Clearly, plainly. God says, listen to it again, do not be drunken with wine. We're in his dissipation. The idea of dissipation is that we're just kind of moving away from God, from his commands, from his teaching. We're dissipating. That's the idea. And so the scriptures clearly teach drunkenness. That's not something that God desires of his people. Then we mention a third passage to you, and Paul mentions this to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And naturally, you might think up front, how does this teach us that we ought to stay away from alcohol? Listen to these words, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 23. Paul says to Timothy, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. Now, in Paul and Timothy's day and age, they knew that alcohol, a little wine, might settle the stomach. They knew that. And yet, here's the point we want to drive home. Timothy wanted to be such a good example. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, be an example to the believers. He wanted to be such a good example that although he and Paul both knew this in their day and age, Paul as an apostle had to write and command him, use a little wine. This is okay medically for you to use it, not, not to get drunk. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about overdose. That's not the idea. One might take a little a cough syrup. That'd be the idea. Settling one's stomach. Paul had to actually command Timothy to do that even though he knew it. Why? Timothy went so far as to abstain from it even when it might have been helpful medically for him to use that. Do you see the extent Timothy took that? And so, friends, the Bible does teach, as a Christian, I ought to be sober. Well, let's now ask this question. This is the one that a lot of people think about. What does the Bible then say about social drinking? Yeah, we, we understand about drinking and alcohol and drunkenness is wrong, but isn't it okay for a Christian or is it okay for a Christian to go out occasionally socially at a restaurant and have a beer or a margarita? What's the Bible teach about that? Again, we want to let God's truth be the answer. Here's what we know. In the Bible, social drinking is not authorized by God. Now, a lot of people will say this. Okay, show me the passage in the Bible where God says it's wrong. Wait a minute. You've got the cart before the horse. The Christian does not say, show me where it's wrong. The Christian says, show me where it's right. And friend, you cannot find that in the Bible. You see, this is what God says. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If whatever I do in word or deed, action or speech, is to be authorized by Christ, where's the authority for that in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6 says, we're not to go beyond what's written. Can you stay within the pages of God's holy word and authorize social drinking? Where's that passage at? Secondly, social drinking has the ability to ruin my Christian influence. Friend, people who study the Bible, Christians who live by the Word of God are aware of these passages, are aware of the evil of alcohol, and if I go and am involved in something like that socially and people see that, that has the ability to affect my way to reach people, my Christian influence. Uh, let me illustrate. The Bible says in Matthew 5 verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, you take this for an instance or for an illustration. Let's say that you're driving down the road and you pass a honky-tonk and I'm coming out the door. Would you turn and say, hey, there went Ben. What a great Christian influence he's been. Well, I doubt that'd be what you'd say. You'd have a lot of questions, wouldn't you? 1 Peter 2, verse 21, the Bible says we're to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Can you follow Jesus? To the honky tonk? Can you follow in the footsteps of Jesus and socially drink? Now, I want to deal with this and don't think we aren't aware that some will use this as an objection. Some will say, well, you know, in the wedding in Cana in John chapter 2, Jesus created 120 to 160 gallons of wine to people who had already drunk well. Friend, if you did, you better close your Bible and go home and throw your Christianity away. And here's why. Habakkuk 2 verse 15, the scripture says, we mentioned it earlier, do not Give wine to your neighbor, making him drunk. Now, wait a minute. If Jesus is perfect, 
and he is, Hebrews 4.15. And if the Bible says one is not to contribute to somebody else's drunkenness, and in John 2 they'd already drunk well, either Jesus violated the law or he didn't make alcoholic wine. And friend, if you'll study the word wine in the New Testament and Old, you can see that depending on the context, the word oinos can mean grapes that have been freshly squeezed or it can mean alcoholic. And so let's not jump to the conclusion. The, the master said it, the house said it best, you save the best for last. You save the freshest for last is the idea. And so are we going to say Jesus got people drunk? Not in being in accord with the law of God. Thirdly, a person ought not to drink socially because I want to abstain from every appearance of evil. Is drunkenness and alcohol associated with evil? You bet it is. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. A Christian ought not to drink socially because it's associated with worldliness. James 4 verse 4. Because it might be a stumbling block to a, a, a new Christian because it's spiritually dangerous. How can you be involved in things like that and really say that we're putting the kingdom of God first in our lives? And so what does the Bible teach? Like with sexual lust. The Bible teaches abstinence is best. 1 Peter 2 verse 11, the scripture says, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Is alcohol a fleshly lust? You bet it is. It makes one feel good in his flesh. It makes one feel good sometimes in their mind. It is a fleshly lust. And what does the Bible say? Not in moderation. Here's God's word. Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Friend, on behalf of our nation, on behalf of the Lord's church, on behalf of families, everywhere, we plead with you, accept God's truth as it relates to alcohol. God does not want Christians to be drunk. He wants them to be alert, to be sober, to be ready, to fight the good fight of faith, to run the race. And God doesn't want people running the race, stumbling down in the bar ditch drunk. That's not the way God wants it. God wants us to run with endurance. The race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finish for our faith. And so as we think about the truth about alcohol, let's let God's word be the final say and completely abstain from this evil, ungodly lust. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the gospel of Christ, and to God be We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.